welcome to week 10's lectures on the Hound of Baskervilles. In today's session, I am going to continue the discussion on the nature of Gothic crime and the mythical subtext of this novel. Let's talk about the Gothic curse. The idea of hereditary traits being passed from generation to generation plays a crucial role in The Hound of the Baskervilles. It is the similarity between a portrait of Sir Hugo Baskerville, the villainous ancestor with whom the curse originates, and one of the present-day characters in the novel that enables Holmes to solve the mystery. We saw in the previous session how the curse, uh, the family curse, is an important element of the Gothic uh, mode. This curse connects the past with the present. One of the ancestors of the present day uh, character or characters um, passes on uh, the problematic heritage uh, from the previous years to the present and something similar happens in the hand of Pascal Wilts too. The curse originates with uh, Sir Hugo Pascal Will. Um, it originates in the 18th century. Sir Hugo becomes this villainous um, ancestor who is passing on the hereditary uh, problem onto his uh, descendant and in this uh, novel Holmes uh, arrives at the resolution at the solution to the gothic crime by figuring out the resemblance between Sir Hugo and uh, one of the present day descendants of this ancestor. So Holmes is uh, sharp enough to work out the similarity between the past and the present. The novel also highlights our inability to escape the past in other ways. The fugitive murderer Selden, for example, hides out on the moors in one of the many prehistoric stone dwellings that litter the landscape. This pairing of the criminal and the primitive early settlers in the area emphasizes how our frequently violent and ancestry occasionally re-emerges re -emerges in the present. The broken remains of the stone dwellings also act as a reminder of how previous attempts to tame the landscape have often ended in failure. There are plenty of significant points in this passage, uh, in this critical passage by Greg Boswell. Boswell is trying to uh, establish the connection between um, the setting in which the murderer who's wandering um, in the moors is hiding and the uh, idea of the past. Now, the point being drawn here is that the criminal is associated with primitivism. The criminal is found in pre primitive or prehistoric uh, um, domains or settings and um, it's also very interesting to see how Dartmoor itself becomes somehow primitive, somehow removed from the present in some sense, removed from the urban, sophisticated um, landscape of London. And further, uh, Buswell points out that you know the broken remains of um, the early settlers is an indication that it had been difficult for humans to tame the landscape and um, the largest significance one can draw is that uh, people like Holmes attempt to tame mythical subtext um, legends but uh, ultimately there is um, an element of failure associated with such attempts. 
The landscape even becomes a metaphor for the inex- inexplicable in the modern world. As Dr. Watson observes, life has become like that great Grimpen mire with little green patches everywhere into which one may sink and with no guide to point the track. Holmes' inability to solve the case may be regarded as a triumph for the modern world over the realms of mystery and superstition, but in a sense, the larger mystery into the nature of criminality and evil remains disturbingly just beyond the limits of our knowledge and understanding. Buswell here points out um, how uh, the landscape space itself, this primitive space, this uh, isolated space, this bleak space becomes a symbol of um, the problematic uh, modernity itself. And very usefully, uh, Watson compares life to this great Grimpen mire um, and uh, it's very difficult to find one's way in this mire if one sinks because there is no uh, no um, lodestone drop, there's no direction, there's no guide, there's no help to the right uh, track. Now, uh, the initial attempts at um, solving the mystery and Holmes' inability to solve the case initially may be regarded as um, uh, the as, as the triumph of mystery, as the triumph of uh, the Gothic uh, world over the modern world, uh, the triumph of the past over the present. And further, we understand that our inability to make sense of criminal minds, the criminal psyche, the nature of evil itself um, is, uh, is a, a massive challenge to um, knowledge in modernity. Uh, after all, despite all one's expertise in the worlds of uh, scientific uh, knowledge, it is not easy to uh, find out one, one, um, one's proclivity towards evil. Doyle's more mirrors an additional element that adds to the fantasy atmosphere, the gothicness of the story. Kathleen Spencer contends that Gothic tales are the first fantastic fictions for they provide a textual confrontation of two models of reality. Todorov would argue that the Gothic elements in The Hound plays the work in the fantastic and canny, since the events that seem supernatural throughout a story uh, receive a rational explanation at its end. We have been discussing how the landscape is uh, contributing to the Gothic atmosphere of this uh, novel. So the Gothicness is constructed by um, the Moors, the Dartmoor itself. Um, Kathleen Spencer, a critic, um, a critic uh, argues that um, the Gothic narratives are, in the first place, um, are fantastic fictions. Um, firstly, because um, they bring uh, an element of fantasy, an unreal uh, perspective to the, narrat- uh, to the narrator. In fact, there is this real world and there is this fantastic world, and when they clash, um, things become uh, complex. Todorov argues that um, the hound could be placed in the context of the fantastic and canny. Um, Uncanny is a useful word to um, analyze the Gothic mode because um, in the Gothic narrative, uh, the real world takes on a suddenly a strange um, perspective and in uh, Gothic fiction such as The Hound, uh, the apparently um, strange things become uh, rationally explicable at the end. So the real becomes unreal, the unreal becomes uh, real. And this kind of treatment is uh, interesting um, to look at the, uh, to study the nature of the Gothic. And indeed, 
Doyle's novel does do this, but only if we believe wholeheartedly in the logical reasoning of Holmes. When we combine the gothic and fantastic elements, we are left with a much more ambiguous text, one that embraces explanation and mystery. Spencer defines the urban gothic as that modern version of the fantastic marked by its dependence on empiricism and the discourse of science. To be modern, continues Spencer, also means that science is the metaphor that rules human interactions with the universe, so the new fantastic adopts the discourse of empiricism even to describe and manipulate a supernatural phenomena. The argument here is that there is the world of reason and there is the world of mystery and both are conflated in The Hound of Pascoe Wells. Kathleen Spencer's um, analysis is used to, to throw a light on the way the Gothic functions in um, Doyle's The Hound of Pascoe Wells. According to Spencer, the urban Gothic is a gothic where the fantastic, the otherworldly, the uncanny, um, the strange um, domain depends uh, for its functioning on the world of empiricism or the world of science. So science is absolutely important to structure the fantastic, in fact, um, even to describe and manipulate the supernatural Phenomena. So there is a very, very close association between the discourse of empiricism, the language of empiricism, the subject of empiricism, and the world of the Gothic, the darker, the gloomier, the bleak world. The Hound appropriates the urban Gothic to add further texture to the fantastic elements that resonate throughout the narrative. The climactic scene in the novel revolves around Holmes's killing of the real hound that Stapleton has unleashed on Henry Baskerville. Real bullets kill a real dog and Holmes is able to conclude that we have laid the family ghost once and forever. The novel by Doyle exploits the urban gothic to intensify the world of the fantasy in this particular novel, uh, the the fantastic elements, uh, the fantastic elements resonates in this novel um, on on the basis of this discourse of empiricism. Um, the climax to this novel happens when uh, Stapleton uh, uses a real dog, a, a real hound, to attack Henry Baskerville, and um, the dog is killed by a real bullet, and the world of empiricism real tangible concrete uh, scientific um, knowledge and equipment are used to lay the family ghost down forever. So you can see how empiricism apparently dominates this world of uh, mystery. Watson describes the flesh and blood hound as a terrible creature. It was not a pure blood hound, it was not a pure mastiff, but it appeared to be a combination of the two gaunt, savage, and as large as a small lioness. Even now, in the bluish, uh, even now in the stillness of death, the huge jaws seem to be dripping with the bluish flame, and small, deep-set, cruel eyes were ringed with fire. This is a fantastic uh, description of this hound, um, the monstrous creature in this uh, novel. And Watson's language is uh, very useful for us to get a, a visceral picture of this creature. And Watson points out that it's it's not um, a pure bloodhound or a pure mastiff. It's not um, you know uh, one thing. It's not uh, from one single breed. You can see this hybrid uh, context for the origin of this hound, and that in in itself is telling. Uh, it's, it doesn't seem uh, like a hound, it in fact seems like a small lioness. So you can see once again uh, a conflation of attributes of two different creatures. 
And even when it's dead, it seems to be alive uh, with a bloodthirstiness. And that bloodthirstiness is, is not from a biological um, domain. In fact, one can see a bluish flame um, you know, dripping from its mouth. And its eyes seem to be full of fire, ringed with fire. So you can see a variety of forces, scientific, the natural, the biological, being used to orchestrate a very very frightening creature that has associations with the hell. The glow is merely phosphorus, nothing more. So Holmes seems right. The ghost of the legend is put to rest, explained away. That Inspector Lestrade is on the scene is further proof of the rational explanation, but Watson's description of the dead dog as a terrible creature that is neither bloodhound or mastiff uh, makes the real creature somewhat otherworldly, further reminding the reader of Hugo Baskerville's death by the supposed mythic hound. We understand that the bluish flame uh, dripping from the mouth of the hound is just um, phosphorus and it's nothing more than that and this apparently hellish creature seems to be explained away uh, in a rational manner. Further, the presence of the inspector on the crime scene is also an indication that, you know, uh, this uh, entire uh, uh, plot, the crime plot, is uh, being uh, neatly tied up and explained away with the help of uh, structures of um, power but despite all these elements of um, science and, and power represented by Holmes and um, Inspector Lestrade, whose job is to kind of uh, participate in this discourse of um, crime in such a way to neatly explain all the cues and the details, despite all this kind of uh, structures we understand from Watson's description that this dead dog is, is or was a, a horrible frightening creature and further the fact that it belongs to neither one particular entity neither mastiff or bloodhound it doesn't seem to be just a mere dog it's it's fierce like a lioness and it has all these um, uh, apparently inexplicable uh, flames and, and rings of fire associated with its uh, appearance. With all these kind of suggestive um, descriptive epithets, there is a sense that there is a sense that this creature uh, does belong to um, the other world, um, and and uh, there is a suggestion that perhaps Hugo Baskerville was really killed off this ancestral figure um, from whom the curse originated um, did perhaps die um, uh, at the jaws of this uh, mythic hound. As Holmes and Watson pursue Stapleton into the mire, uh, Watson again personifies the bog as a place that, with its tenacious grip, plucked at our heels as we walked, and when we sank into it, it was as if some malignant hand was tugging us down into those obscure depths so grim and purposeful was the clutch in which it held us. Again, a very, very suggestive passage in the uh, novel, uh, The Hunt of Vasco Wells, uh, we see how Holmes and Watson chase um, the criminal Stapleton uh, who uh, runs into the mire and Watson and Holmes uh, follow him and Watson's description is um, fantastic because he communicates to the readers the sense of being sucked into the group in mire um, and he says how we sank into it and it was not just an an element of nature, the bog was not just an element of nature, it's as if uh, some really evil, vicious hand was plucking, tugging us down, bringing us further into the depths of that grim and uh, uh, purposeful uh, uh, place. Um, and and uh, his language seems to tell us that there is a, a mind 
you know, there is a functioning uh, brain behind that um, organic space. And, and what's in further points are that, you know, the, the space seemed to kind of, you know, hold them prisoner. So, uh, again, it, this kind of um, description strengthens or intensifies the Gothic uh, mood and, and tenor of this uh, narrative. They never capture Stapledon, losing sight of his footsteps, but no slightest sign of them ever met our eyes. If the earth told the true story, then Stapleton never reached that island of refuge towards which he struggled through the fog upon that last night. Somewhere in the heart of the great Grimpen Mire, down in the foul slime of the huge morass which had stuck, which had sucked him in, this cold and cruel-hearted man is forever buried. Stapleton vanishes at the end. We are assuming, we are to assume, we are to assume to his death, but there is no real material proof that he is dead, further reinforcing the mythic subtext that begins the novel. Again, this is a very um, interesting argument made by John Pennington, um, whose ideas I've been discussing uh, uh, for the past um, uh, half hour. In this uh, set of ideas, um, Pennington argues an interesting theory um, in the absence of the footsteps of uh, Stapleton. We have seen how Holmes and Watson chase uh, Stapleton and he enters the bog, Grimpen Mire, to escape them and he uh, hopes to reach that, a particular island of refuge and Watson seems to be convinced that he never survived, he never escaped. In fact, Watson's argument is that he was buried in that um, foul slime in that great group in mire and this seems to be a perfecting end a perfect end a fitting end uh, for this cold and really cruel hearted man and yet and yet uh, since there are no footprints since there are no evidence to argue um, that this man really escaped, uh, that this man really died. There's no body, uh, there's no uh, concrete proof to uh, point out that he is in fact buried in this Grimpen mire. The, there is also a further sense that perhaps he had escaped, perhaps he is alive, perhaps he had survived, and this survival possibly reinforces the mythic subtext, the possibility of the legend surviving. So uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic argument. It's an interesting argument made by John Pennington that seems to uh, strengthen the world of the supernatural, the world of the spirit. Now Stapleton is part of the Baskerville curse, haunting the moor with a demotic hound. In the final chapter, at re a retrospection, Holmes fully controls the narrative explaining the details of Stapleton's plan. Stapleton used a trained dog to scare Sir Charles to death and to do away with Sir Henry. Holmes' solution from a detective narrative standpoint makes sense, but it seems somewhat anticlimactic, seems too probable, too mundane and commonplace, downright inadequate for the story that the reader has witnessed. Holmes' solution is just too tidy. It is to be remembered that Stapleton is a key part of that Baskerville curse and in the certainty that Stapleton is dead or in the absence of that certainty that Stapleton is dead then there is a possibility that the haunting seems to continue, that the haunting could possibly continue, um, that the demonic hound could be um, visiting the moors again. In the final chapter, we see that Holmes is uh, trying to explain away everything with utter logic. He tells the uh, you know uh, the readers who are um, following the narrative as well as um, his audience that. Stapleton used a trained dog to scare uh, Sir Charles to death, who had a weak heart, and therefore he collapsed uh, at the sight of this really frightening um, demonic hound. And according to Pennington here, 
uh, the narrative makes too much of a sense. It's um, in fact anticlimactic in his uh, uh, point of view, and he says that the explanations are too mundane, too ordinary, and uh, too inadequate. There, there, there is a lack of um, uh, sufficiency in establishing uh, certainty. And um, he finally says that it, everything seems to be too neat and orderly in the uh, explanation, in the logical um, explaining a way of things by Holmes. In fact, he says that the reader may feel cheated by having the fantastic made commonplace. Yet questions still remain. What do we make of the cursed hound of the Baskerville legend? What killed Hugo if not this hound? What of the Grimpen Mire and the bog and fog that permeates it? Um, after this long narrative, this um, central chunk of the story, which is dominated by supernatural um, stuff, the legend of the bloodhound, um, this kind of explanation seems um, to be a bit of a letdown according to the perspective of um, John Pennington. In fact, the reader might be um, slightly disappointed uh, by the way things have been explained away. Despite this, on the other hand, we have um, questions which seem to proliferate. Um, you know, if, if this dog didn't kill um, Hugo, then which hound did, in fact, um, do away with him? Why did we have the legend in the first place? Uh, what do we make of the Grimp and Meyer? What does it represent? Is it literal? Is it an, um, you know, a manifestation of the evil? Uh, what about the fog that kind of permeates and cloaks it? So these are some other questions that seem to be unanswered at the end of the narrative of the Hound of Baskerville's. Holmes's pedestrian story, the what of the crime, the solution, is at odds with Watson's fantastic narrative, the plot, the how of the narrative. The reader tends to hesitate over accepting Holmes's solution about the immediate crime that also projects the solution to the overall Baskerville curse that has mysteriously haunted the area since 1742. The reader intuitively believes that Holmes' solution is the right one for these particular recent crimes, but the reader hesitates over extending that solution as a way to debunk the ancient myth. Pennington makes a distinction between the narrative of Holmes and that of Watson and calls Holmes's narrative pedestrian, commonplace, ordinary, mundane. And uh, he um, describes Watson's as the fantastic one, the exciting one as well. The reader uh, is hesitant, according to Pennington, to uh, accept the explanation of Holmes uh, because um, the Baskerville curse seems to have uh, haunted, you know, have seems to have been around since 1742, since the 18th century. Uh, the reader could buy Holmes's theory intuitively for the present uh, crimes, for the recent crimes, but um, Pennington argues that it becomes difficult for the reader to um, extend this solution to as far uh, back as 1742. So it becomes difficult for the readers to reject the ancient myth, to reject the uh, legend of this hound. And that by implication means that the world of mystery cannot be brushed aside. On the one hand, Doyle as the creator of Holmes is a scientific materialist bent on the logical art of deduction. On the other hand, Doyle as a spiritualist believes in otherworldly phenomena. This tension in Doyle's worldview becomes artistically realized in his greatest Holmes full and deductive novel, The Hound of Basco Wells. From a reading of Doyle's biography, we understand that Doyle was both a man of science as well as a man who believed in the world of the spirits. He had one foot in um, science, the other foot in the domain of um, the supernatural. So that kind of tension that coexisted in Doyle's personality is reflected uh, in The Hound of Baskerville's too. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.